Or maybe you were using it last time I did yours. I don't know. Last change in the last three years. <laughs> okay. I got, I've got a lot more professional now, that's for sure. Nice. At least I like to think so. All right, you ready? Yep. <clears throat> What's up, UX fam? How's your mom and them? Welcome to another episode of Beyond UX Design. I'm Jeremy. If you're new here, welcome to the show. I am super stoked to have you. And if you haven't done it already, please consider subscribing to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you are a regular here and you feel like you're getting something out of the show, I would really appreciate you leaving a five-star review. That'll help me out so much more than you can imagine. This week's episode is brought to you by Jeff White and his incredible UX storytelling toolkit. Now, lots of people talk about the importance of storytelling for UX designers, but Jeff brings actionable clarity to the concept and he shows you exactly how to do it. He breaks down different real world scenarios like how to use different storytelling methods to present your work to clients and stakeholders, how to craft a better case study for your portfolio, and how to improve portfolio presentations for job interviews. And I love Jeff's approach to storytelling here. It's not just your simple once upon a time kind of stuff. And since you're all amazing listeners, and I know that this course will help you out so much, I've partnered with Jeff to get everybody listening a 10% discount if you use the code BEYONDUX when you check out. So head on over to beyonduxdesign.com slash storytelling and use the code BEYONDUX at checkout to get 10% off Jeff's storytelling course to learn some incredible techniques to influence your team and advance your UX career. This week's audiobook recommendation, of course, is Articulating Design Decisions by the great Tom Griever. Tom's book is aimed at helping designers communicate more effectively with stakeholders and their teams during the design process. It offers strategies and tactics for presenting your work and explaining your decisions in a way that builds consensus and allows the team to move forward. And the book emphasizes the importance of understanding the concerns and objectives with stakeholders. You know, that whole empathy thing we always talk about as UX designers. And it offers some practical techniques to present designs in a compelling and persuasive manner. And the book underscores the ideas that good communication is as crucial as the design itself. And this is really one of my favorite UX books. You've probably seen my memes floating around (laughs) LinkedIn or the internet. Uh, And I'm not just saying that because I've got Tom on the show today. So head on over to beyonduxdesign.com slash audible trial to start your free trial. Download Articulating Design Decisions completely free and help support the show. And as always, thanks so much to Chris, Siraquan, Stacy, Radu, Meg, and Andrew, John, Mark, and Kevin for all their support. And if you want to join those fine folks and help keep the show independent and ad-free, you can become a patron for as little as $3 a month. That's less than a dollar an episode. And if you do that, you'll get some sweet, sweet perks, your support. And of course, if you think the show is worth sharing, then I would love it if you told some friends. So today I am excited and honored. I'm honored to have Tom Griever join the show. And if you've listened to this show or my other podcasts or follow me on LinkedIn and for any amount of time, then you already know all about Tom. But he's been in the design industry for about 20 years now. He's worked at some really cool big name companies along with some other companies that you might have never heard of. But you probably know Tom from his incredibly popular book, Articulating Design Decisions. Uh, and I probably talk about it way too much. Tom, welcome to the show. I am so excited to have you. How's it going? Thanks, Jeremy. No, I I love it. I'm glad glad to be here. I think I think you did a, a better like a description of the book and the value than I could have. Like I need I need you to come with me now when we go places. I think. Oh, no, you know I'm cheap. I'm very cheap. Okay. Just, uh, just we'll buy me a beer and uh, pay for my hotel rooms, and I'll I'll go wherever you need me to go. All right. Uh, cool. <laughs> so so Tom, I'm so excited to have you on. Everybody that seems to have you on for their shows, uh, they they always seem to talk about articulating design decisions. Right. And, you know, for me, though, I, I like I've actually talked to you once before back in the day in my other podcast, Retro Time, and I feel like there's probably some different things to explore. You and I had a really great conversation uh, a couple of weeks back, and we talked about something that I, I've seen quite a bit, and you seem to have a lot of really great insights here, but this idea of rigidity versus adaptability or flexibility, you know, some people think of it as, as sort of their duty to hold true to these principles and stuff. But it right. often kind of backfires for them. So I'm curious. I want to talk a little bit about this idea today. So first thing, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, people go to school, they learn this process. And, and, and this is something that I, I think your book speaks to so well. It's this idea that, you know, process is irrelevant to everybody else. <laughs> and what we think as UX designers is not going to just be something that everybody buys into. And we're often right. kind of coming up against these stakeholders that are pushing back and we don't agree with what they say and stuff. I want to talk a little bit about about your experience here and and what you've kind of seen and how you've seen this sort of work in the real world. 
Yeah, well, there's definitely been this theme throughout my career that, you know, in a sense, as designers and design leaders, we are always trying to champion and advocate for best practices in design. We want to move our organizations forward, improve the maturity of our design in the face of, you know, people who maybe don't have that same perspective, right? They don't understand kind of like the value that we're trying to bring sometimes. And so it often feels like the job (laughs) is doing nothing but advocating for that and trying and trying and trying to convince people to support us and help us move that forward, right? And how I see this playing out occasionally with people that uh, have been on my teams is you end up you end up getting people on the industry who are extremely passionate but then also extremely rigid about how they define design and how they see it and where the lines are drawn for them to a point that it just becomes really difficult to work with them and they develop a reputation as being someone who's just kind of difficult to work with and i i believe that they're they're trying to do the right thing right they like they they, they're they're uh, owning their their principles. They're they're holding on tightly to their values, and that is in fact a good thing. But they're often doing it at the detriment of those relationships and those people who can help them succeed, right? And so, like you said, it end, it ends up kind of backfiring um, if it plays out in that way. And so, like that, I think that's that's the challenge is being able to find this right balance of advocating for our craft and moving it forward but doing it in such a way that we can actually have like a positive influence and and not a, a negative perception on us as, as individuals. And one of the things that I, I love in your book, and this is something that, you know, when you read it, it's, it's funny because you read it and you're just like, oh, of course, but you never really hear anybody talking about this. And it's this idea that relationships are just so important to getting our, our stuff, our designs out into the world for a user to use. We can't, release the thing. What was the point? It was, it was a complete waste of time. Yeah. And what I love about this idea of relationships, it's, it's that idea that you have to build trust. Right. You know, and it's so hard to build trust when someone comes to you and they know, Oh God, I have to have this conversation with Jim again. Oh, he's going to yell at me about something and blah, blah, blah. And you know, it's so hard to build that relationship when, you know, people dread having those meetings with you, you know? Yeah, right. No, I, I think I love I loved the little character voice that you did for us there for, for a moment because I do, th- I do think it encapsulates uh, the feeling that people sometimes have when they come to meet with us. They know when they come meet with us that we're going to push back. We're going to say we need more time. We're going to say that we have to do research. We're going we're gonna to come up with all these things that are absolutely important that we should always be trying our best to make sure that we're like following these best practices, but it, it can get exhausting for the other person when like, I just, I just need to make this change, right? Like I just need to be able to come to you and feel comfortable that we can have a reasonable conversation about what is happening this week in your design work without having to like take three steps back or 10 steps back every single time and pick apart the design process and say that it was all wrong, right? It is exhausting. I've actually heard that from people inside our organization who would come to me and be like, hey, you know, I, I've been working with this designer on your team, but frankly, it's just exhausting, right? Like, and so it's like, I, That's a- <laughs> I, it's not, and it's not that the, even that the relationship was bad, right? There, there, there wasn't, they weren't being rude, right? <laughs> This designer wasn't like disruptive or arrogant about the way that they communicated this stuff. This product partner just knew that it was going to be a little bit of a fight every time they had to go talk to them. And they they were just kind of tired of it, right? It was just, there was a level of kind of like anxiety and tension that existed between them simply because they just knew that this was always going to happen no matter, no matter what. That's interesting too, though, because this is sort of begs the question, you know, and and I think you mentioned this the second ago, it's not about giving up on the things we believe to be true or the things we think are important. I'm curious, like, how does the designer balance that? Is this something that, you know, we already ask a lot of junior designers, how how could, you know, this is one more thing that seems like a daunting ask, I guess, for a junior designer, but even senior designers, I feel like, have a lot of problems with this. I'm curious from your perspective, is there some method or technique or some way that you've kind of said, 
I'll do this for a little while. And if I get pushed back, I'll go with the flow. Or is it, is it something you just like, how do you decide which hill to die on? Yeah. I mean, if we want to get real practical here, I think the first thing that I think of is looking for patterns to identify, right? If someone in the business is coming to me and saying like, hey, we need to do X. And my first instinct is like, oh, well, that's fine. But we forgot to do A, B, and C before we do X. And I know from my UXE brain that like that's the right way to do things. And now all of a sudden I'm uncomfortable because they're not honoring what I believe to be important to do, right? So in that case, I may try to have a at the at the beginning a more casual conversation with them, right? About like, okay, uh, sure, we can do X. But let's talk about what that looks like. I would really wish that we had done A, B, and C. And can we talk about how to do that better next time, right? That's fine. Like that, I think that that happens. And so then I I look for that pattern. If it happens again, all right. Now we've got. We're starting to see a pattern. I'll talk to them about it again. And by the third time, now I, I believe there's an opportunity for me, if nothing has changed, to, to go to them maybe a little more directly and a little more explicitly and be like, okay, look, hey, I, I, I need us to center on what our roles are, you know, what your expectations of me and my team are so that we can make sure we're doing our best work because I'm getting concerned that doing it in this way is ultimately not going to yield that for you. Right. And, and you'll notice that I'm deliberately trying to frame it in terms of the other person, right? You're saying you want us to do X. That's fine. We can do that. But you need to know you will get the best result from us and you will get the best outputs and ultimately outcomes if we do it in this other way, following this pr- process. So I'm trying to demonstrate what the value is to them in doing it that way, as opposed to coming off as like, well, I'll have you know, in designer <laughs> land, it has to be done this way or we didn't do it right, right? Because that, that, that makes it about me. That makes it about me and my principles and what I think is important. And when you're talking about someone who, I mean, even if they have some measure of empathy for you, they, they, they may just simply not care about that stuff, right? And so what do you do? How do you influence someone who doesn't care about the same things that you do? Well, you have to find the things that they care about. You have to figure out how to frame it in a way that there is some benefit to them ultimately. Otherwise, they have no motivation. And you mentioned something too that I think is, is something... Some teams do, obviously, but I feel like the teams I've been, a lot of them, they haven't really established outcomes, right? Sure, the, yeah, yeah. The outcome is build, shipping a feature for them, most of the, right. but really, what's the ultimate outcome here? What are we building and why are we building it and what do we hope to improve for the user, for the business, whatever it is? And it's interesting, too, because when you think about the outcome, you know, does it matter how we get that outcome? <laughs> if we got that outcome, did it matter that we didn't do it, quote unquote, right or did it matter that we skipped a step or we got to the end result that we were looking for? And it's hard often, I, I think, to determine what is worth fighting for. Yeah. If you don't know what you're why you're doing it in the first place. Right. So you're you you use some interesting language there. And I, I I've used it too already as as well, but the word the word fight, right? And you know, I try to be intentional about avoiding language that implies that this is you know, a fight or a battle or a war, right? Like that there are winners and losers, right? That, because that's not what we want either. Even the term pushback to me has some negative connotations. I'm, I'm pushing on you because I, I disagree. Heck, I'll even go so far as to say I would avoid the use of the word disagree, right? Like there's, there's nothing that is like a bit more abrasive than talking to someone and just simply stating out loud, well, I disagree. And now let's talk about, like, even if we're in a relationship of trust where we have permission to disagree with one another, it is still going to, like, create bristles in that other person. I Actually, I love how you phrase that because it, when you think about it, you know, we fighting, pushback, uh, all these things, it implies two sides, people, an enemy. It, it applies someone that you're, 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 you're an antagonist. And right. when you think a lot about, like, psychology, in-group bias, out-group bias, things like that, what you're doing is you're creating an out group. Absolutely. And you're saying, if you're not in my group, you're not, you're, you're obviously out of my group and you are the enemy and I will fight you. And anything you say now, I'm going to automatically disagree with because of these cognitive biases that we, we just have as humans. Right. And when we talk like that, we're, we're creating an other and we have product team versus UX or engineering versus UX or stakeholders versus UX. And instead of thinking we're all on the same team, how do we move forward? And, and again, I think this is such a, uh, an important thing that, that, you know, when you hear it, when you say it aloud, you're like, of course. Yeah. But we never do it. You know, we always tend to do the opposite. You know, I want to be clear on a couple of things here. First of all, I, I, I think that 
most people who experience this, even, even the person on my team, I think there's, I think there's good intentions there, right? Like I think people are trying to do the right things, but possibly in the wrong way. So that's kind of like the first thing. The second is that I don't intend to imply that we should just do whatever other people say, that we should allow them to kind of like take advantage of, of our desire to maintain good relationships, right? This isn't about maintaining the status quo, right? This is about moving our design practices forward, but in a way that is healthy and builds trust and not in a way that creates tension and breaks down those conversations and relationships. Because when you're not doing it in a way that is healthy and contributing to the relationship, you're ultimately not going to succeed anyway. So there are relationships, I'll acknowledge, there are relationships where the, the environment is toxic, where people are manipulative, where we absolutely should not put up with bad behavior. That's not what I'm talking about here, okay? What I'm talking about is like, generally speaking, normal relationships of two people just working in an environment and a designer who is so inflexible that they couldn't possibly move forward with an idea, concept, problem statement, design, unless they've checked every box and said that they did their design process right, right? That, 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 that's what we're talking about is demonstrating that there's, there's enough flexibility in our process and our approach that we're not going to come across as being overly rigid and difficult. Let me rephrase that last question then. Sure. In terms of more positive language. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> not fighting. Okay. Yeah, so when that. you have these principles and you, you feel like you want to hold true to your principles, how do you determine when to stick to your gun, um, your guns? That's another thing. Here, let's try this <laughs> right, again. There it is. Uh, to stick to your principles. There we go. Yeah, I'll just yeah. say it that way. Stick to your principles and insist on, on following this method that you believe to be true versus going, maybe being more pragmatic and going, maybe going with the flow for lack of a better term to, sure. to move the process forward. Right. Absolutely. So context matters a lot, doesn't it? So obviously if we're in an environment where we know that we, we have the time and space to explore, right? We have a good relationship with our partners and we know that they're open to hearing from us about what, what we want and what we need to accomplish. Or there's a particularly tricky space where we don't have the confidence that we have all the information and we need to do more work to get it, right? Those are the kinds of environments where it seems appropriate that we would be able to, to say like, this is really important to our process. We, 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 we run the risk of not getting the right outcome if we don't do these things, right? That's one context. There's another context, right, where your company has just experienced layoffs and everyone is scrambling to try to figure out how to get stuff done now. And you've got a leader coming to you and being like, oh my gosh, Jeremy, I just need you to do the thing. Can you please do the thing? That's probably not the right time to stand up and be like, I'm not doing the thing unless I get to do this research <laughs> over it, right? Like, it's probably not like the right environment. Sometimes there is an urgency about it, right? Sometimes there is a really critical deadline for the business. Sometimes there's just simply other stuff going on in the background that we don't know about. And those are the times where you have to use your discernment to understand, like, is this a moment where I do that? Or is does this context warrant me kind of like taking a hit perhaps to my pride, but doing that in service of the relationship and in the, the outputs and outcomes that, that my company expects of me right now. Now, obviously, I can't operate that way all the time, but there are times when we probably need to do that. One of the ways I kind of look at this too, and I've worked in some large organizations, the you know, thousand engineer org with a bunch of, you know, hundreds of product owners and product managers and all these other people on the product side. The way I've, I've approached this over time, because this has taken me a while, I was very principled back in the day and it's taken me a while to get this, but, but to realize there are certain things that I can control and there are certain things that I cannot control. And when it comes to, you know, sticking to my principles, I'll ask myself, is this something I can actually control? Or am I just going to be bitter and pissed off after the decision is made, even though I had no way to influence it one way or another? You know, or is this something I can actually influence somebody? I do have some control and I can make a difference. And I think for me, that's sort of, you know, where I'll look at this and say, is this worth standing up for what I believe to be correct? You know, and again, assuming there's, there's nothing unethical or illegal going on, but, you know, is this something I think we should do? Can I control it? Is it, 
is it going to get the outcome that we need? Is it worth fighting for? And will will my you know am I going to get a return on my time investment, my effort investment by doing that? You know, that's kind of something that the way that I've kind of looked at it is what can I control? And if I can't control it, just move on. <laughs> just, you know, go grab a coffee or a beer or something and just just deal with it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the word control because I think a lot of times this does come down to control for us, right? We, we want to have some measure of control over our uh, processes, over how we do our work, over our own careers, right? That, that's natural, right? That, and, and we all we all can and should have a certain amount of agency to determine the kinds of things that that we do. At the same time, you can't control everything. It's not all about control. And what would it look like to let go of some of that control? And instead of feeling like the the right solution is to strong arm someone into doing it your way because you told them so, as opposed to building up sort of like an influence campaign internally with your partners in the organization so that they want to do it because they see the value and benefit of doing it that way. Gosh, even if you convince them that it was their idea, right? Whatever it takes, which one is actually going to be more effective in the long term? And I think people get frustrated. Maybe they even get lazy and they just get to the point where they throw up their hands and go, fine, all I can do is just say, sorry, we have to do it this way, right? Like, this is, the, this is the way I know how to do it. This is the only way to do it, right? I think there's a much longer game to play here where uh, it, takes, it takes time. It takes time to influence people, to build that trust, to work up those, those muscles to, to influence change in any organization, right? Change management is incredibly difficult. That's why there's entire roles and disciplines <laughs> dedicated to managing change inside organizations, yeah. organizations, right? And I don't think it's all that different. You can't expect to just tell someone, this is how we do UX. And for that person who doesn't share that perspective to just instantly snap and go, okay, great, let's do it that way, right? That, that's not realistic. Now, one of the things that I, I hear when, I, when I'm thinking about this topic, when, one of the things that I'm kind of thinking in my head is this idea of followership. A couple episodes back, I had Dr. David Leitner come on, and he's an author. He's been he's uh, talks a lot about followership and all this stuff. And it, it was funny because on LinkedIn, I talked about leadership behaviors or something, and somebody somebody tagged Dr. David Leitner and said, "Hey, Dr. D, check this out." And he's he replied, and he's like, "This sounds a lot like followership." And the first time I heard that word, I think I giggled a little bit. I was like, "Follow!" I thought it was a joke. I was like, "Followership? Come on, what the hell is followership?" Um, and so I, I had him on because I wanted to talk about this and, and the idea of followership. And this is something Dr. D mentioned in the interview was the West is very leader focused, yeah. right? We, we yeah. celebrate CEOs. We have leadership books and, you know, countless leadership books. And there's, there's entire sections at the bookstore devoted to leadership. No one ever talks about the followers or the followership or the, the people doing right. the actual work that actually have to, you know, execute. Yep. And one of the things that Dr. D mentioned in, in, in our interview was this idea of follower disagreeing, being courageous to disagree, but at that certain point, you commit right. for the good of the team. And that's something I think a lot of us have this, this huge issue with is understand, like, I'm, I don't agree with this, <laughs> but I'm going to help execute so we can move forward, Yeah, right? And again, the, the themes in your book, the, to me, that's all about, like, the whole point is to move forward. Yeah. We just want to move forward. We want to, we want to go to the next step. Even if it's not the step we chose, move forward. And I just, I'm curious your, your thoughts on followership. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before, but that's something I had never heard of until about six months ago. I, mean, I know a lot of people probably have it. Hopefully they listen to that episode if they listen to this episode. But anyway, I'm curious, is that something you you're familiar with, that concept of followership? Yeah, I've heard of the concept. And I think it is definitely something like the word, I think potentially is, I don't know. I, I think I think it might make some people uncomfortable. I think yeah. this idea that we can or should be followers in some instances is not a value that we have in Western and American culture in particular, right? We do value leadership even at lower levels of the organization. We talk about how important it is to develop leadership skills over time, right? And so this idea that you are or would be a follower from time to time is, I think, probably not talked about enough, but it is important, right? We, we do it maybe even if we don't talk about it that way sometimes. There absolutely are times when we're following what, what, what our leaders are telling us we need to do, right? That, that does happen. 
And I think we probably need to lean into that a little bit more from from time to time. It's mentioned, it's, it's interesting, you mentioned this in the context of like the greater good. I think you do see these themes popping up now and then in, you know, more like socio or even like political issues, right? Like that, like there are, there are some things that like we're not going to agree on, but for the greater good, like as a society, we should be making these decisions to move forward. And I don't want to steer the conversation towards, you know, social or or political spectrum. But I I think our work environments are a microcosm of like a larger social structure, right? And there is a sense where, yeah, in order to have an organization that moves forward at some point, we have to commit to supporting one another to move forward. And sometimes that does mean that what we're doing is following someone else's lead, right? Like if you, if you work for someone else, if you take a job where you have a boss, which is the majority of people, you are deliberately putting yourself in a position of being a follower of that leader. Whether you like to call it that or not, that's the position that you're in. Now, maybe you have a great relationship with your boss and that boss really values your opinion and your perspective and gives you lots of freedom and autonomy to do things in the way that makes you feel good. That, that's great. That's an awesome relationship to have. You're still a follower. At the end right. of the day, right. you you ultimately have to follow the lead of that boss. And, and and unless you go out and start your own company and you don't have a boss that you report to, all of us and on some percentage of our day, we are following other people. And and that's okay. I like I think we should be comfortable talking about that concept too. And a lot of this too, like the following and, and understanding when to follow, when to step back and say, you know what? All right can't do anything about this. Let's just go with the flow. A lot of it has to do with one of the major themes of your, of your book as well, which is this idea of empathy for your team, mm-hmm. right? UX designers, we always talk about empathy for users and very rarely does anyone say empathy for stakeholders, empathy for their boss, empathy for team members. But I feel like a lot of the themes that we're talking about, it's really built, you know, your, your emotional intelligence here is built up over time because of the empathy that you've got for your team. Right. Yeah. I'm curious here, what are your thoughts there about that concept, empathy, building empathy for your team to allow you to be less rigid and more flexible? Yeah, I think it's fundamentally the acknowledgement that, you know, my my job isn't all about me, right? Like it's not, it's not about me and what I want and what I can get out of this, right? Checking off all those boxes to make sure I did my UX process right, making sure that I have something that I feel good about putting in my portfolio, right? Like doing this so I can... If I, I, I think sometimes people have this idea that like, well, if I can really, you know, dig in and fight for this, this change and this process and, and, and make sure that we're doing UX right, that will help me, you know, get visibility in the organization or get that promotion that, uh, that I want. Right. But that, 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 you know, that's a, that's a very selfishly centered, uh, perspective. And when you start to realize that there are other people who ultimately affect your ability to get those things as well then it, it changes how you see your, yourself and, and your role. And it, and it moves from one of being, uh, in, feeling like you need to be or are in control to one of like understanding how, how can you build relationships and influence, right? Um, and so I think that's probably the first step is just kind of acknowledging that, that it's not really about you. Yeah, you know, that's interesting too, because one of the things that, that it implies, it's not just about you, it's about everybody else. What is the rest of the team dealing with right now? Sure. What are they, what are they, what's going on? You know, when we talked last time, you mentioned, you know, stuff about like with all the various things going on with COVID, there's layoffs everywhere and people are, you know, obviously frustrated. They're trying to do stuff, maybe do work to build up their portfolio so they can get a job. But at the same time, their bosses are dealing with stuff. Stakeholders are dealing with stuff. Product teams are obviously dealing with stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm just curious from your perspective as a leader, as a manager, someone who has direct reports that may be doing things like that. What type of advice do you have for those people, those junior, maybe senior individual contributors who are somewhat selfish? How do you get them to think about the bigger picture and understand that, you know, there's more going on that they might actually not have any idea about? Yeah, I think it's an important message to realize that your leaders always have stuff going on that you don't know about. And maybe it's just information you're not privy to because the business has something going on in the background they're trying to deal with. Maybe you'll eventually find out about it. But like, and I often tell my team, if you're ever confused, 
by the reaction from a leader, especially someone who you know to be, you know behave differently or generally support you, and now they're unsupportive, you can bet there's something else going on behind the scenes that is driving that. And I'll, mm. I'll actually demonstrate this with two recent examples. One was a, a, a guy who worked for me, and we had someone on the team who was going out on medical leave. And it was sort of unexpected, just kind of last minute. We had some very real like deadlines that needed to be met. Like we couldn't let the product suffer. And at the time, uh, because it was so on such on, on such short notice, I didn't have the ability to go out and hire someone else, even a contractor to come in and help take this stuff across the finish line. So I approached someone on my team that was closest to this work and knew the most about it and was the best fit, in my opinion, to help out. Now, we were going to make some concessions, right? Like, okay, you can do less on this project over here but because we need you to fill this gap over here. So it's not as though I was asking this person to, you know, suddenly, you know, be putting in 60 hours of work a week. That's not what I would ever expect to do. But I was asking for their help, right? And I was under a lot of stress and pressure trying to figure this out. And this wasn't kind of like the only moving part for me. So I went to this guy and I presented, you know, like, hey, like, here's what we need. Like, this this would be really helpful. I know, I even acknowledge, like, I know this is not ideal. I get that it's maybe going to feel a little bit like unfair, right? It's not going to be your favorite thing, but like, this is what I need. And he flat out said, no, he wasn't going to do it. And the, the reasons were because he didn't like the way that project was run. He felt like it was being done incorrectly, that they weren't following a good process, that the person who was leading it uh, didn't understand value of design. I forget all the reasons, but they were more based on principle than anything else. It was just like, I, I don't like where that product is headed. I don't think the decisions that are being made for that line of business are good. And I don't want to contribute to it because I don't think that I could actually affect change. And I respect that for sure. But it put me in a very, very difficult position as as his leader, right? Now, I ended up finding someone else who would do it. And, you know, when it comes time for conversations about promotions or even layoffs, that absolutely weighs into my perspective on where people sit in the organization, right? So that's one example from uh, someone who reported to me. Other example that comes to mind is that I was looking at one of my bosses and something that I felt like with it, I identified a gap that I felt like they needed. And I kind of talked to, to, to him about it. And he was generally like, yeah, okay. And, and I wanted to kind of create some artifacts and center some strategy work around a particular part of the business. Um, so I spent some time working on this. And then later when I took it to him and shared it with him, he seemed uh, kind of disinterested. He seemed kind of like, okay, you know, cool, like, thanks, <laughs> right? Like, it didn't exactly get the standing ovation that I was <laughs> expecting. I mean, I was, I was helping this guy do his job better. I was, prof- I was going above and beyond. I was spending extra time on something that wasn't being asked of me. I was doing something that probably should have been in his wheelhouse. And then when I gave it to him, it was like he didn't care. Oh, and wow. I, I felt super frustrated and undervalued. Right. Well, fast forward about three months and he's resigning and presenting Mm. us with a new leader who will replace him in this meeting. And all of a sudden it made sense to me. Right. All of a sudden I realized that at that time when I was taking that to him, he was dealing with something totally different. And this was an executive in our company at the time, which meant like that he was already most certainly having conversations with the CEO and the board about his departure, right? There were all kinds of things going on in the background. I made it about me and what I wanted and how (laughs) I was trying to like make a name for myself and like, you know, create this vision for where we were headed and get all those kudos. And in the end, I wasn't astute enough to really understand that there were other things going on. There's always things going on. Yeah. Now, was this your direct... Supervisor? No, it was one one removed. One so above. this was your, my your boss's grand, boss. Yeah. Your grand boss. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what I often give advice is, you know, one-on-ones are so critical. They're so important. And again, you know, one-on-ones yeah. are your space to promote your ideas and your, you know, for you to voice your opinion on things. And this is like something I tell people a lot is like, even if your boss doesn't set up a one-on-one, you have got to go set up a one-on-one for yourself. Even if nobody else in your team does it. And this is like, like I'm curious from your perspective, uh, you, maybe you were doing this, I don't know. 
But going in and talking about these things that you're thinking about and and relaying this to your direct supervisor, I'm thinking about doing this. I think this would help. Here's why. You know, that should be a really great place to get the feedback before you go and do any of that stuff. Because again, it's that idea of being a great follower is not, you know, going off and just doing whatever you want. It's it's following the lead, the strategy, the vision, the plan for the good of the business. And hopefully your boss is going to say, you know, maybe right. let's hold off on that, you know? Now he might not know, he or she might not know about, about right. his boss leaving. So, there, you know, in that case, maybe that's something, who knows if that's avoidable. But, you know, a lot of times I know, for instance, my boss is in all these leadership meetings in this big company talking about future things that he probably knows about that he's not allowed to share. Uh, and so in theory, he, maybe he can't say, Right. Maybe, you know, you can't do that because this explicit reason, but I was like, let's, let's focus on something else, you know, maybe guiding that passion or uh, maybe is a better way to say it, guiding that passion towards something more valuable. You know what I mean? Well, okay. So yeah, in, in this, in this particular case, I did talk to my direct leader of, of, about it oh, so and they, they were, know, they yeah. were generally supportive <laughs> of it as well, if not, you know, excited about it. Right. And, 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 and encouraged me to do it because it was the right thing to do, right? Like if you were to define the right approach to a problem and how as a business we should be thinking about it and what our strategy should be, this was absolutely by the playbook, the right things to do from a UX and product development standpoint. But because I didn't have the insight to understand where the business was and what the business actually needed from me at the time, it ended up being a wasted effort. Now, it didn't create conflict in the way that we're kind of talking about some of these other areas, but it wasn't ultimately providing value to the business either, right? And I think that's where it fell apart, right? I, I could have, if I had been a better follower or maybe even read between the lines a little bit, like if this, if this person isn't super enthusiastic about something that I think they should be, then maybe there's a sign, maybe, maybe, there's, maybe there's an input there for me to pause and go, okay. If he's not excited about it, yeah, yeah. then maybe I shouldn't be excited <laughs> either, right? Like, and not not that that should be the way you measure every conversation, but I think, but my in in retrospect, there definitely was data there for me that I did not process and allow to inform the decisions that I made, and I probably could have done better at that. I could have been a better follower. Instead, I was thinking about me and what I knew to be the right thing. I knew this was the right thing, and it wasn't. Well, that's the other thing too. I mean, tying that back to the overall idea of, of rigidity and flexibility and, and principled, what's the right word? Principled inflexibility. <laughs> that idea though of, of context, reading the room, gauging how other people react to things that you say yeah. would in theory, I think, help you understand, am I being too inflexible? Am I, am I not helping here? Am I actually hurting here? And that idea really overall, I mean, a lot of the themes we're talking about end up being very much about emotional intelligence and, you know, uh, being able to, to, to gauge your, you know, what you're doing, be self-reflective and understanding your own actions and how they impact the rest of the team and empathy for the team and all those other things. And, and to me, I was just thinking about this emotional intelligence to me seems like the way to foster some of these concepts or grow some of these concepts to maybe try to practice so that you can get to a place where you're asking yourself, am I, am I actually helping here with this conversation or am I actually hurting or, you know, wh what's going on here? So anyway, emotional intelligence can't hurt anything. Absolutely. Well, and I, it's worth noting that, you know, we're kind of talking about leadership and followership and being principled versus being flexible as if these are opposite ends of a spectrum or as if there's like some binary choice here. And I guess it's worth considering that both can exist simultaneously, that we we should stand up for our principles and values, and we should make sure that we and our teams are doing good work that we know to be the right thing to do. And we should also remain flexible and be good partners in the business. I think there's, there's kind of always two tracks that we're working on here, right? We've got the here and now. We've got like right now, this is what my leader needs from me. Like I have to execute. I have to build the thing. I have to say yes to this right here because that's what they're asking of me and that's what they need. And I don't know all the reasons. It's imperfect. It's maybe even frustrating for me that I have to do it that way. But I'm, but I'm going to say yes and I'm going to do it in service of making my team and the product successful because that's what I'm being told to do. At the same time, in parallel, running with that, 
I am also going to set aside some of my mental capacity and effort to make sure that the next time we do it, it's incrementally better. And I'm going to talk to them about it in a sidebar conversation. I'm going to create some artifacts that I can share with my team. I'm going to do a little a, a one-on-one or have an open UX coffee with everyone in product so they can come learn about what we do. Like this job of advocating for what's right, as well as doing what's needed of us in the moment can coexist. And they probably should coexist. And I think where it gets problematic is when people think that they can only be on one end of the spectrum or the other. That's a really great point. Yeah. And, and the other thing too, that I was thinking about this at, at the same time is this is certainly easier said than done. But if, if you feel like you're working at a company and they go against your principles at every turn, maybe it's time to find another job. <laughs> maybe yeah, that's totally. not the right yeah. team for you. Maybe, maybe you can get another team within the same company if it's a big org or, or find another job altogether. So, you know, right. it's, it's like, no one's, no one's asking anybody to go against their principles here. Obviously, if, if it's that bad, quit and find another job where you do fit or where they do, where, you know, that does meet your principles and then you don't have to find yeah. all the time, you know? I, yeah, I do think that's an important thing. It can be hard to acknowledge that yeah. though, right? And it can be difficult to see that when you're in the moment. Uh, some people are very sensitive to this and would, you know, quit and go find another job at, at the drop of a hat, right? Because they are so principled. Other people are very loyal, right? They want to see it through. They want to see if they can affect change. But you're also right that like at some point, you may have to stop and look around and go, maybe this isn't the place for me because the way that they're operating, the way that they're doing things feels too much like a struggle, right? It feels like it's it's a whole lot of effort to not get out of it what I need in order to be the individual and have the kind of career that I want. And that is absolutely an appropriate conclusion to come to. Yeah. Now, the other thing too that I was just thinking about was just remembering uh, from your book, one of the things that you mentioned in the book was to create almost like a persona card or a persona for your stakeholders in a way. And it may, right. persona might not be the right term. I can't remember exactly how, what you called it, but uh, you know, some kind of a, a quick reference card for the various people that you work with. And yeah. one of the things that I was just kind of thinking about, I, don't, I can't remember if you, if you mentioned this specifically in the book or not, but the idea of creating a stakeholder map, understanding who your stakeholders are, who, they're, you know, who they influence, who influences them, and building out this sort of stakeholder ecosystem, maybe is, I don't know if yep. that's the right term. Mm -hmm. And that way, yeah. you, know, you and your team and everybody on your team, or that's on that product at least, or project, can get on the same page as far as how does that, you know, how does, how does Beth like to communicate versus Joe? And when we're talking right. to Beth, let's make sure we're all talking this way and we're, we're addressing these issues because that's what she cares about versus Jim who cares about that, you know? So it's kind of, it's a lot of upfront work, but I think one of the worst things that could happen is for a UX team to not be on the same page and having conflicting points of view and conflicting messages with stakeholders because then they think, wow, this team isn't on the same page. Like, what, you know, what, what's going on over here? You know, they, they, they don't agree. They must not know what they're doing. And then you, you erode all that trust and everything that you've built up over time. And then it makes it really hard for anybody to go work with them because they, they don't, it's not that they don't trust you. They just don't trust the UX team because of all these right. other issues that they've had in the past. So, yeah. And it, it ultimately, it ultimately erodes the credibility in UX and, and in our product design practices and, and that only hurts in the long run. It actually doesn't, it doesn't help. But yeah, in, in, the, in the book, I talk, I talk about, yeah, mapping your stakeholders according to both their, their influence over your outcomes as well as kind of like their interest in your projects. And there, there are four quadrants where you, you can put them. And I, it, it all rolls up to this concept of like trying to understand our work from their perspective, the same way that you would try to understand your interface from the perspective yeah. of the customers and the users, right? We want to think about you know, this meeting, uh, their, what, what is their, what are, what is their interface with our design team and how can we make sure that we're creating an experience that, um, actually solves the, their problems in a way that is also delightful, right? Like we want to create moments of delight in our UIs. Uh, we should be just as intentional about creating those same moments of delight with our stakeholders. We want them to want to come work with us. We want them to see the value in, in what we bring. And just gets a lot more more difficult um, when you're not flexible um, in in terms of like seeing their perspective and understanding how to frame it for them. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. We my my boss Matt and I we were actually talking a couple of weeks ago. 
we've got this regular recurring call Friday morning with this, we call it the connected customer experience team. And it's all these various people from various orgs coming together. And we're talking about, you know, uh, basically recast scrum scrums, if you will, we're talking about all the various things we're working on, how all the things are connected. And our goal, we actually were talking about this because somebody mentioned, this is my favorite meeting of the week, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. we're like, that's exactly what we want. That's the kind of, we want UX to be the, you know, fun's the wrong term. We don't, not necessarily fun for the sake of being fun, but you know, engaging, interesting, thoughtful, creative, helpful, you know, those are the kinds of feelings that we want the rest of the team to kind of take away when they work with the UX team, not exhausting, monotonous, you know, demanding, right. fa- you know, fighting, whatever, whatever adjective fighting would be. Right. But, you know, so it's, I love that you mentioned that. And that's something I, you know, I don't hear a lot of people talking about that. I'm glad, I love that you, you call that out. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's super important. You just, you end up in a lot more productive conversations, getting a lot more information than you would otherwise, right? I think we need to look for more opportunities to create energy. If you see someone getting excited about something in your meeting, great. Like, how can we reproduce that in our next call? Like, what? Yeah, why were they excited that. about that? Like, let's talk about this. What was exciting in that moment for them? And how can we make sure we create more moments of excitement for people? To your point, it's not just fun for the sake of fun. Right. There, there's a there's an actual outcome there, which is keeping people engaged and involved in conversations with us so that we can create better outcomes. And, and you can't do that if you don't have that level of energy and excitement. Yeah, I love it. What you need is a little NPS slip that you could pass around to everybody <laughs> in the meeting. Would would you recommend the UX team to a friend or colleague? Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. Scale of one to ten. And then, you know, then you get a bunch of metrics and M- NPS. That's, I, that's, that's it. <laughs> NPS I'm doing right. it in my next my next meeting. I'll this let you know. It has to be physical paper, though. It has to right. be physical paper. That's what really makes the, the bit. In fact, hilarious. we'll just we'll ask everyone in the moment <laughs> to like raise their hands. <laughs> on the call. Oh, your researcher will just like eye roll over and then they'll, they'll collapse <laughs> and unresponsive for all the right reasons. All right, Tom. So I love it, man. This has been uh, a fantastic conversation. Anything else here that you feel like we didn't get a chance to cover that you think is just really important for these junior and even senior UX designers to understand when it comes to this idea of being flexible versus rigid? I, you know, I think we've, we, we've said a lot <laughs> so far you know, I think just being just being available, like just being open to the possibilities is is all that it takes, right? Like we we've talked a lot about the different things you could do or how time consuming it might be to actually think through like the perspective of these stakeholders. And I guess I would never want anyone to be discouraged into thinking that this has to be a time consuming process. Literally just having a mindset that is open to wanting to help other people. Um, and believing that if you can help make other people successful, then you'll be successful as a byproduct, right? Like just having that spirit and that attitude going in is sometimes all that it takes. So don't overthink it. Don't try to make it complicated. Just be open to to where your leaders and other people in the organization want to take you. And you might be surprised at how how actually healthy that can be and how much change you can actually affect when you have that approach. Yeah. And, and that social capital, that political capital just snowballs and it just yeah. builds up over time and incremental, incremental, incremental changes end up, you know, you look five years later, you're like, whoa, we did a lot. That's yeah. crazy. So I love that. Awesome, Tom. All right. I've got a few questions that I like to ask all of my guests to help all of my listeners get to know my guests a little bit better. Five questions. Don't have to think too hard about it. First thing that comes to the top of your head, what is your favorite non-design book? Okay, the first thing that comes to mind for some reason is Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Oh, okay. That's one of those books that I read in high school. Yeah, that it's a high school. Book, has yeah. just <laughs> stuck with me my whole life. And I'm not entirely sure why, but I've I've read it several times since then and I keep going back to it and I I think there's there's something about a book that was written in I think it was written in like the 30s, right? There's something about yeah. a book written in the 30s that is projecting so far out into the future that as you see some of these same themes in our own society, like even today, it just it yeah. continues to fascinate me, right? Like have being the type of person that Aldous Huxley must have been to have some sort of like almost prophetic perspective on world <laughs> and and the, and the and society and where it was headed. Um, that that's something I really I, I look up to. I, I really appreciate that. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, same for me with uh, 1984. I had to read that in high school. And uh, it was kind of one of those like dystopian books. They, they always make us read these dystopian books in high school, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and it was the same kind of thing. I was like, oh my God, it's so, it's so, it's so prescient, but it's hundred, what, you know, like I said, 23, I don't remember when 1984 was written, but yeah. Oh man, Brave New World's a good one too. I haven't read that in a long time. I had to read that in high school, but I'll have to go and reread that one again. All right. What is your favorite non-design podcast? Um, okay. First thing that comes to my mind, it's not going to be super relevant to the audience here, I don't think, is a podcast called The Read Aloud Revival. Okay. It is, so we, we homeschool our, our kids. We're a homeschooling family. And so Read Aloud Revival is very much of kind of like geared towards homeschoolers. So if you don't homeschool, it probably will be less relevant to you. But the premise of the, the, the Read Aloud Revival is that so much of like life and relationships and education can happen just in the context of reading a book aloud to each other. And oh, I love that. if you see, you know, you see this a lot more with younger kids who can't read yet, you know, parents will read picture books to them and then eventually start to read chapter books until they learn to read on their own. But the, the premise of this concept is as much around like, no, even with teenagers and older kids or even as adults, it can be super valuable just like as a community to read a book together out loud yeah. um, because it creates kind of like this experience together the same way that you would enjoy watching a really fun movie together and discussing yeah, it afterwards, yeah. right? You can create these kinds of experiences when you read a book together. So that, that that's one of my favorites. The only other thing that I'll mention is like any, any version of kind of like a whodunit serial murderer, like mystery <laughs> podcast, especially like real life ones. I, I love those kinds of things. And there's a bunch oh, out there yeah. now. Um, but I, I love, you know, the following along on the story of like, you know, trying to solve a, a murder mystery. I love those. There's one that I was listening to. I think it was like only on Spotify though, which always kind of drives me crazy, but it was called the commander. Mm. And it was, a, it was a eight part, mini series about this woman who was dating a commander in the Navy or something. Yeah. And she found out that he was completely lying, had a double life, had a, like a family and everything else. And like, it was like a spy or something. And he had this weird thing going on with like some foreign government. Anyway, it was like really fascinating, but it, it all kind of breaks down. Like it, not, not quite that murder mystery, but it was very interesting. Anyway, guy ended up getting arrested and going, well, anyway, I just ruined it. I should <laughs> maybe I'll cut that out. Spoilers. I'll cut that out. Spoiler. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry, America. <laughs> uh, totally ruined that for you. All right. What is your favorite meal? My favorite meal. So I'm going to go with anything that is some version of like a meat pie. So mm, okay. um, pasties, uh, definitely oh, yeah. like a steak and ale pie kind of thing, chicken pot pie for sure. Any, anything mm. kind of in that category. So I, I, I travel to the UK every now and then. And all, I just, the, the thing I look forward to the most is like literally just a walk up stand where you can just buy a pasty and just like go right. Like, or, or oh, even yeah. like a nice pub where you can sit down and have a really great steak and ale pie, whatever, the, whatever it is on the spectrum. I don't care if I'm, if I'm in the UK, that's pretty much all I'm going to eat the entire time. And for special occasions here at at home, we will make pasties, and they're they're time consuming. Like they can yeah. actually like take yeah. some time making them from scratch. So it's not definitely a special occasion kind of thing. I love that. Yeah, that's really cool. I um I really like empanadas. Those okay, are, sure. Those are really good. Yeah, down yeah. down in Louisiana, where I'm from, they have these little meat pies, which are basically like empanadas, but yep. they're they've got like you know usually a little spicy. They got maybe have shrimp in them or crawfish yep. or something. But yeah, it's like a little hand pie. Oh, so good. Yeah, yeah. Man. No, I'm down with that. Same kind of category. Yeah, love so that. good. I'm with you. That's something you can like. You could like, eat and walk. I love that. Yeah. All right. What is your favorite vacation spot? Probably my like my actual favorite vacation spot is probably going to be any sort of beach. <sighs> I, I think I'm there's I think there's something about the the sound of of the water right. And the environment, like it's, it's intended to be just kind of like slow pace. There's, there's nothing else that you're supposed to do at the beach. I mean, there are things you can do, right? <laughs> yeah. Nothing else you're supposed to do. And, and especially having kids, my kids are older now, but even when they were younger, right? You can just let the kids just go free. Like they can just play, yeah. like you don't, you're not go? having to watch them. You're not having, <laughs> you're not worried. You know, we can all just hang out, right? I think that's maybe one of my favorite vacation spots. Now what's, Funny about that is that we have not been on nearly as many beach vacations as we should have if that's actually my favorite <laughs> vacation spot because I live in the Midwest and there just aren't it's beaches. To to, it's I like know. it's like a it's like a chore to to get to a beach. So Yeah. So us, you know, being from New Orleans, we were like five hours from 
you know, the panhandle of Florida. It was like some of the most beautiful beaches in the country. Yeah. And then we moved to Cincinnati, <laughs> We're like 16 hours away. I know. It was like a two day drive. But we recently found Michigan, which okay. uh, we had, we randomly happened to like last minute thing. We're like, oh, we'll go to South Haven, Michigan. Yep. And I was pleasantly surprised with Michigan. I know you're in Illinois. You, I, you, I don't know how far you are from, from that. I am, but, but we've been to the Michigan dunes. There, there are lots of, uh, lots of beaches around Lake Michigan, even on the Wis uh, Wisconsin side that are really good. So yeah, you'd be surprised at how good some of those some of those beaches are. I wasn't expecting a lot, you know, yeah. comparing it to Florida, but when we especially South Haven, I mean, the, it was you know sand. There were waves. I mean, it <laughs> looked, a, if if, that's if you close your eyes, for a beach sand and someone waves. Drop, <laughs> if someone dropped you off there. Be like, where are you? I would have been like. Florida? Right. You know, I don't know. Yeah. But I mean, it was, uh, it was very coastal. I got a very coastal vibe. Yeah. From it's it. just that you can only, there's only three days a year that you can actually That's be right. there. That's the only problem. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. It, it snows until August and then it uh, starts snowing again in October. So yeah, you're, uh, yeah, you got, you only got exactly. a few days. I love that. All right. What is your favorite design tool that is not Figma? Okay. Okay. This might be controversial. I still, to this day, love Axur. And I don't I know if Axure there's any Axur fans I'm out there or not. Fan. You are. Axur has, uh, yeah, I just, I can't get enough of Axur in its day, especially like a long time ago. It was way ahead yeah. of all other tools that have come and gone since then, right? And Figma, it's, and Figma doesn't even have the features no, that no. Axur had 10 years ago, right? The way yeah. that you could create multiple states and panels and the interactivity oh, yeah. that you could create. Like you could build a really robust prototype that wasn't just basically a glorified PowerPoint. I mean, most prototypes yeah. nowadays, you click a link, it takes you to a different page, right? No, right. you could actually like have dynamic data that you pulled oh, yeah. in and make things change right there on the page. And you still can't really do that. Not as easily as you could in, in Figma or without, you know, special plugins and other, you know, third party stuff. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Figma, I guess the new, I haven't really played with the new variable stuff and, and uh, not variables, the uh, dynamic content. Yeah. And it gets yeah. there a little bit, but uh, man, being able to type into a form field and have that data saved and passed yep. to every other page in the prototype. Just pull it from a spreadsheet. Oh, it's right? amazing. Like, yeah. I mean, it was so great. Yeah. You could yeah. do a totally robust prototype for for usability study is amazing i i will say though but my problem with Axur was i would try to recreate like every bit of functionality in the prototype and i would just go down rabbit holes and spend oh, countless yeah. wasted they could hours be so complicated you could make them so <laughs> complex and it would get to where your file just like can barely load because it's like loading all these yeah like at some point you have to decide for this interaction we're going to duplicate it and make a new page and remove yeah. all those extra I states know. yeah, yeah I, I definitely spent way more time no if i could take the interface of figma with the yeah. functionality of Axur, that's that would everyone, be everyone always complained about the interface and what is that's just because it doesn't look as cool like that's just about the ui right i will say for Axur, what i didn't like was when you had all these dynamic panels they had different yeah. colors over them so like you couldn't see uh, what the interface looked like. It was hard like. to see where they were. Yeah. yeah the, so the like layering had, concept yeah. wasn't really there. Yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. And it was like different color boxes and shades. Yeah. It just made it really hard to see the design of it for it me, a, you know? Yeah. But yeah. anyway, I don't know. I, if it could streamline the interface like Figma and be web-based, that would be really cool. And then do all the other stuff. Yeah. Uh, although I've seen people do some cool stuff with like Framer and ProtoPy, but they're they're just not as, it's not as robust as Axure. Anyway, I'm with you on Axure, man. I'm, I'm an, Axure, uh, an Axure fan. All right, Tom, that is it for today. Uh, I don't have anything else. Before we get out of here, tell everybody one more time, where can we find you online? Where can we find your book? Anything else you want to plug? Anything else you got going on, conferences and stuff like that? Feel free to share. Let everybody know. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I'm pretty easy to find. I'm the only person with the name Tom Griever. So you can really? Google my name and find me. <laughs> Um, but I'm active <laughs> on LinkedIn. I have, uh, dormant accounts on Twitter and Instagram and, um, and my website is tomgriever.com. Very simple. As far as the book goes, you can find that at Amazon. Amazon tends to be the best place to get it. It's probably cheaper there than anywhere else and has free shipping. So you can go buy, go buy the book. There's an audio book too, for people who are more into audiobooks. It's oh, on yeah. audio. The audiobook is on Audible now, which now is you great. didn't do the narration on the audiobook, did you? No, I didn't. And let me tell you, it's a kind of a weird experience listening really? to <laughs> well, because the book is written in the first person, right? So right, everything is right, like right. my stories. Yeah, hearing, but him. hearing this like 
booming, <laughs> like, like movie trailer type voice tell yeah. my stories is a little unsettling. That's so funny. Um, yeah. I'm curious. Well, I could, I could probably keep talking about this for, I'm, I got a, I have so many questions about this, but did you get to pick the, uh, the narrator or did the, did no, the, in fact, the I, I pick wanted, I wanted to do it myself because so many of the stories yeah. are just literally me talking about my perspective and, a, you know, something that happened to me. It just seemed weird to me that it wouldn't be read by the author, but O'Reilly didn't even, they didn't even entertain that. They were just kind of like, no, we have people that we do that for. Uh, and the next thing yeah. I knew, you know, they were sending me the files and it was like done. So uh, I, don't, I don't even know the process <laughs> for how they pick people or what, but the guy has a very nice sounding voice, but it's a, it's a little too nice, right? It's yeah, just a little too nice. Yeah, it's too too radio uh, radio yeah. do- DJ sounding. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I saw the other day somebody on LinkedIn posted that uh, they had a translation. I don't know if it was Russian or Ukrainian. It was some, something in Cyrillic. How many okay. how many translations are you up to now for the book? Uh, yeah, there's eight or Tinder? nine. Uh, wow. So okay. the Chinese, Japanese, Korean, um, Polish, German, Spanish, Portuguese. I've seen the Portuguese. I'm trying to think if there's any others. I'm I'm I may be forgetting one. Okay. Yeah, this but, one looks Cyrillic. I don't know. Maybe I was just glancing at something else, but that's awesome. It may, we'll it co- may be. I don't I actually don't find out about that either until after the fact. Occasionally I'll just get one in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> just like that. I have like a bookshelf of all the translations. That happened. <laughs> <Which> yeah, <laughs> that happened with the uh so that happened with the Japanese translation. One day I look in my mailbox and there's a Japanese version of my book, and I was like, uh, oh. What do you know? That's crazy. I didn't even know that was happening. (laughs) And then with the Polish translation, I was in Warsaw speaking at a conference. Oh, wow. And and I had a local. I was like, hey, I just want to go to a bookstore and see if my book just happens to be in a book. It's really rare to find Mm -hmm. my book at a bookstore. Um, Just because bookstores don't stock a whole lot any, oh, anymore. Yeah. I'm not sure that my book has really like reached that level of popularity yet where, you know, Barnes and Noble is going to want to stock it. But I, I had this person take me to the like the largest bookstore in Poland, um, and, or in, at least in Warsaw. And um, we found my book and we found a Polish translation. And wow. neither one of us knew that there had been a Polish translation. It was right. So I had to buy it, of, of course. So I actually paid. Oh, that's awesome. I actually paid like 30 bucks for my own book just so I could get the Polish translation. <laughs> yeah, whatever. That's great. Oh, yeah. That's a good souvenir to take home to your kids. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's awesome. All right, Tom. Well, it was great talking to you today. I really appreciate you coming on. And all the links for everything, we'll put all that in the show notes for everybody to check out. Make sure you check out Tom's book. I do, I will say this again, one of my favorite UX books. I recommend it to everybody. And I've actually had people tell me to like stop recommending it and just like, how about a different book? I know you're going to say that. How about a different book? Uh, so anyway, Tom, keep up the great work. Love the stuff. Thanks for all the great insights. Appreciate you coming on today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. All right, y'all. That's it for Tom and me for today. I hope we helped to shed a little bit of light on this idea of being overly rigid and inflexible versus maybe a little bit more pragmatic with your team. And I'm curious, have you run into any of this stuff in your day-to-day? Have you ever been so inflexible that it just turned your whole team off to your ideas? How did that work out? Let me know what you think on LinkedIn or shoot me an email at hello at beyonduxdesign.com. I'd love to hear from you. If you liked what you heard today, don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you feel like you're getting something out of the show, I would love it if you left a five-star review. That would help me out so much more than you know. And if you know somebody who might find any of this stuff useful, then why don't you tell them about it? That would be fantastic. If you want to help keep the show independent and ad-free, check out all those Patreon sponsorship packages at beyonduxdesign.com slash support. You can join Chris, Siroquan, Stacy, Radu, Megan, Andrew, John, Mark, and Kevin by supporting the show for as little as $3 a month. And there are some awesome perks like a badass holographic Beyond UX design sticker. You can get a shot on the show every week. There's even a package to meet with me for 30 minutes every month. Don't forget to head on over to beyonduxdesign.com slash audible trial to download Articulating Design Decisions by the one and only Tom Griever. Sign up for a free 30-day audible trial. Cancel at any time and the book is yours to keep forever. And in case you forgot, I've partnered with audible.com. So anytime you sign up for a free trial, you'll help support the show. There's no obligation. You can cancel anytime and the audiobook is yours to keep forever. So get a free audiobook on me and help support the show. Do yourself a favor and head on over to beyonduxdesign.com slash storytelling. Use the code beyondux at checkout to get 10% off Jeff White's storytelling course. So go learn some super valuable ways to influence your team and advance your UX career. Remember to sign up for the newsletter and check out all the past episodes along with all the show notes at beyonduxdesign.com. 
I hope you keep coming back for more great UX tips from Beyond UX Design. And until next time, remember you're more than a designer because there's more to UX and design. I'll see you around. Take care, y'all. Hopefully it will make your job easier and not harder. No, I'm sure <laughs> it'll be great. In that regard. There's only so much smarts you can add in the editing. <laughs> I need like an AI filter, like a make this sound smarter. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Add the smart. Adobe needs to fix that. <laughs>